All right. Hello and welcome, everyone. We'll get started in a minute, just waiting for our room to fill up a little bit. All right, well, welcome everyone to uh, our second pandemic virtual version of Top Pitch uh, presented by Thai Philadelphia and PACT. Uh, my name is Danielle Pinto. I'm the Senior Director of Member Success at PACT and really excited to welcome you all here today. Um, before we get started, I'd just like to give a shout out to our sponsors of this program. As always, Comcast and BC Universal Lift Labs. Uh, usually we do this program in Lift Labs at Lift Labs, uh, and we're so excited to eventually someday be able to get back there. But in the meantime, just really grateful for their support throughout, uh, along with Osage Ventner, Venture Partners, who uh, has been uh, sponsoring this year's Top Pitch series. So just a little bit of level setting before we get started. Our format here in Zoom is we have five companies that are presenting for you today. They'll each do a five minute pitch. Then we'll have our judges panel do a five minute Q&A. Uh, all of the attendees are muted, but the chat is open. So you can make comments and support our presenters, et cetera. You'll have an opportunity to ask questions of our presenters after the presentations finish. We'll hop over to our Remo networking lounge. What you'll see is a link to that Remo networking lounge in the chat. We'll post it a few times so you don't miss it. Uh, and that's recommended you visit in your browser, preferably a Chrome browser. You'll be able to meet the companies at dedicated tables there. And there, our judges will deliberate a bit and then announce the winner right within that Remo room. So with that, I'd like to introduce Luke Butler, who's here representing uh, Lyft Labs, just to tell you a little bit about Lyft Labs and what they do. Thank you very much, uh, Danielle, and I share your excitement uh, about getting back into the Lift Lab space. Um, the the space that we would normally host you in in the Comcast Technology Center is is a lot more interesting than my bedroom um, that I'm currently sitting in. So hopefully we get back in there later this year. Uh, Lift Labs um, at Comcast NBC Universal, we're the uh, the front door for startups um, building in media, entertainment, and connectivity. Uh, that want to develop partnerships with our business. So we run a series of programs, um, all designed to uh, scout and partner with uh, interesting early stage companies that are doing things that our business is interested in. Um, we develop focus areas each year, and, and this year the, the main areas that we're interested in um, are next generation entertainment, personalized experiences, future of work, and connected living. Um, I'll share some information in the chat, um, which gives a little bit more of an outline of, around those areas. Um, but the, the program that we're recruiting for right now, which I think is could be of interest to this audience, is our accelerator program that we run in partnership with Techstars. Uh, we just opened applications last week. We'll be uh, recruiting companies until the middle of May um, for a program that will start uh, likely virtually uh, in mid-August and run through through early November. Um, so if you or companies in your network are uh, interested in it, please reach out to me um, and I'll share information in the chat uh, around the application. But with that, I will hand it over to Aljit, Doy, uh, Aljit Joy to talk a little bit more about uh, what's happening this afternoon. Aljit. Great, hey, thank you so much, Luke. And uh, for everyone attending, we've got about 50 or so folks right now. And uh, thank you for coming this afternoon and taking I'm out of your busy schedules. Um, my name is Aljit Joy. I run in I run a early stage investment arm uh, company in Philadelphia. But uh, more importantly for today, I'm one of the founding charter members of Thai Philadelphia. So a shout out, call out for all the charter members who are on the call today. Uh, and for those of you who are aware, not aware of it, Thai Philadelphia is one of the 65 chapters around the world as part of Thai Global. And the purpose for us is really to mentor, advise, invest, and foster the startups that are in our local ecosystem. And we've been doing this since uh, 2017. And this is actually our 12th uh, startup pitch event. And we've been doing this in partnership with PAC. Uh, the winner of this event gets an automatic entry into the PAC Capital Conference. And, and we've, we've had a really good uh, experience with our companies. So this will be the 60th, 60 companies so far that have gone through this. 
uh, over the last few years. Um, just in terms of stats, we've uh, I think companies that have gone through this, there have been two exits already. Uh, several of them have raised money at the Lions Den at PAC Capital, especially the last couple of years, uh, they've gone on to raise money uh, at the Lions Den. And in total, I think we've raised, the companies that have gone through here have raised over $40 million. Uh, Neuroflow is a recent success that just raised uh, 20 million in the Series B as well. It was one of our first companies uh, in our top pitch event. Um, so we've been, we've had great success in identifying great companies at the early stage uh, and matching them up with investors. And that brings me to the audience. We have a mixed audience today. So uh, it has accredited investors, uh, corporate folks, as well as uh, founders and uh, early on, early stage entrepreneurs. Uh, the, any investment ads that the founders are making or offering are, are particularly directed to the accredited investors. So I just want to put, put that out there. Um, we've, uh, and as I mentioned before, uh, the success for our group and our chapter in running this is, is, is the charter members and the charter members are the lifeblood uh, of the organization and chapter here. And we look forward to, if there are any questions, you reach out to me, uh, myself or Doc Pargi and other charter members who are in the audience. Um, so thank you again for uh, today. And we have a great lineup of companies. We have uh, uh, CKM Analytics and Brian Seidman. We have Naturaz and Mumbi Dunjua, who is the CEO there. Michael Graham of Epilog Systems. Uh, Carolyn Horner of Gen Z and Dr. Rakesh Shah with Doctors Link. So thank you again to all the presenters and sharing your companies with us and this investment opportunity with us as well. Uh, with that, let me pass it over to Doc Pargi, uh, who's the president of Thai Philadelphia, who will uh, introduce the judges for us today. Great. Thanks, Aljit. Thank you, Luke. And Danielle, as always, thanks uh, to you and Heidi for putting this together. Uh, so thanks, everyone, for joining. And uh, what I wanted to do uh, is uh, introduce the judges. We have a rock star panel of judges. Uh, and, uh, and then we'll just go right to the presentations. Um, so first, we have uh, Catherine O'Neill. Uh, Catherine is uh, part of Jumpstart New Jersey, also a co-founder of Broad Street Angels. Uh, quite active in Angel Capital Association and really a champion for um, angel investing in the region. So we're uh, uh, thrilled that she could join us today. Uh, next, we have uh, Paul Martino from Bullpen Capital, founder of Bullpen Capital. Uh, Paul has become really a rock star VC. Uh, uh, you know, he's from the area, but uh, you know, uh, uh, was a um, uh, sp spent a lot of time in the Valley, made a lot of contacts there, was a Kleiner funded entrepreneur, Kleiner Perkins funded entrepreneur, and has invested in uh, early stage in companies like uh, FanDuel, Fake Spot, Splitwise, uh, WAG, Spot Hero, I mean, you name it, dozens of companies and, and the early check in So thrilled to have Paul there. It took, uh, took me a while to get Paul to come. He's very busy and uh, glad uh, you could join us, Paul. And uh, finally, we have Bill Marvin. Uh, Bill is the CEO of Instamed and also the head of JP, uh, Morgan's, uh, JP Morgan Chase's healthcare payments and treasury business, uh, which is you know, uh, uh, essentially um, uh, Instamed, the company that he founded. Uh, Instamed really was one of the great uh, technology exits in the region over the last several years. Um, Bill is a longtime friend and uh, you know, really, uh, really uh, had, a, had a big, big exit and we're glad that he's able now to give something back to the entrepreneurial community. So. That's our judges, thank you guys. And uh, we'll kick it off with uh, CKM Analytics and Brian Seidman. Thank you. Okay, can everybody see my slide? Looks good, Brian. Okay, great. All right, thanks for having us to this event. I'm Brian Seidman, I'm the president and CTO of CKM Analytics. Um, I've attended a few of these events. This is my first one virtual. Um, thanks for having us here. Um, I wanna tell you a little bit about our organization and the product that we're bringing to market, which is called TK. Um, CKM Analytics was um, actually cr created in, in 2011 as a technology enabled data science consulting company. And the fundamental, um, question they were trying to answer for their clients and go after as consultants was um, 
what the heck's going on in my operation on a day-by-day basis and and how can I improve that using a 100% data-driven approach. So they um, brought the, that consulting enabled package to the marketplace and had some success with it uh, 2011 all the way up till 2018 and in 2018 um, a decision was made to productize the, the offering because they were repeating their engagement um, so frequently and bringing bring that to market, which is what you see here um, titled TK. TK itself is an intelligence engine. Um, we, we look at it as something that augments human decision-making. We're not an automation engine in and of itself. Um, what we do with our solution is we attempt to pull in the messy real-time operational data that people are entering into the systems that they're working in on a day-by-day basis and drive recommendations back to business leaders that operate these business units on how they can become more efficient, how they can improve their service levels, and how they can lower the risk of failure in their operations. Um, The benefits to our customers, and and we've focused most heavily in the BPO um, IT service management space, Um, We have done work and are targeting um, offering this product to the financial services market as well. But the benefits to the users of our solution is we're typically able very quickly, much more rapidly um, than you'd normally be able to do so, identify efficiency gains that um, these BPOs and other organizations can take advantage of that can amount to 30% plus payback uh, very quickly. In in addition to that, because we drive efficiencies back to each business unit, um, customer satisfaction increases. We take a look at things that are failing in an operation, whether it be a failed automation or failing infrastructure that's causing a lot of work in an operation and return those things back to um, our customers very quickly as well. And most importantly, what we really do is we give Um, the users of our product, complete business process transparency. Very quickly, I'll just go through a couple analyses that we provide within our product. One of the bigger things we do is process mining and analytics. You'll see that up up in the upper left-hand corner here. After we've hooked up to a customer's systems of work and pulled in the digital footprint of what's going on, and and we tie into telephony systems, chat systems, um, work flow management systems, field service management systems, whatever systems are being used in a specific operation, we will tie into it. We're able to dynamically produce maps of each and every process inside of an organization and pinpoint where bottlenecks are occurring, where rework is occurring, um, where automation is failing. We can identify unusual patterns of work. We can identify when work is starting to take longer than it normally does. And we do all of that in real time and and continuously so that as an operator of a specific unit, you have a sense of when failures are occurring. Um, Other things we do is we take a look at repetitive work. Um, Repetitive work could be, for example, I have an IoT device that continually fails and my team has to respond to it. Well, what we do is we identify that for you and there are other systems that can identify repetitive type failures, but we take it one step further. And since we're managing all the work that falls out of that, we can classify the repetitive incidents with the effort that it's creating inside your company so that you focus on eliminating the things that are sucking the most time away from your company. Um, we, we go a level down from these process mining maps and we measure individual worker productivity. We're not um, a, a creepy system where we're installing something on an end user's machine, but we are looking at how they're interacting with systems and how often they get work done. So we'll measure um, a group's productivity across different measures. Uh, A lot of times it'll be how often do they escalate versus how long does it take them to get something done. And this can lead to um, opportunities to retrain employees or assign them to work that they seem to thrive with versus forcing them to do things that they don't seem to succeed with. And the other thing we do inside of our system is we're always taking a look at the optimal staffing for an organization. So we have an effort model Um, where we can derive the amount of effort that is required to complete each category of work within an organization. 
So we're constantly matching demand to supply, demand being how many different items of work are coming in different categories and what's that gonna take me to complete and the supply being how many people do we have in the system currently. And whenever we see mismatches of supply and demand, we let our customers know about that. So these are the types of things we're doing and bringing to the table to enable our customers to become more efficient. Time, and, bro. Go ahead. If you could wrap up, it's time. Oh, time, I didn't hear the two minute warning, sorry, okay. Um, anyway, this is our financial outlook. We're, we're just getting started with, in terms of having annual recurring revenue. Um, we, we hope to do um, $2 million AR, ARR by the end of this year, and, and you'll see our growth path there. And these are the types of customers that we target. So I'll wrap up there. I apologize. Uh, judges, you can start your Q&A, please. Brian, you clearly have excellent domain background on this. I'd love to hear a bit about your background and how you figured out to go solve this problem. This isn't the kind of thing you think about walking down the street randomly. No, and, and to be fair, uh, I'm not the original th thought guy here. There is, a, there is a guy that founded the consulting company before me. I joined them in 2018. However, I, I do come from um, uh, iPipeline um, in, in Philly, where we were focused on improving the efficiency of principally insurance companies. We got into some financial service companies and um, knowing, knowing the guy who was doing the consulting at the time for, for a period of time, um, I knew that this was a, a major problem at every organization. Most companies um, simply lack the capabilities to even understand what's happening in their um, organization. And certainly they can't do it rapidly. So normally what you'll see them doing is they'll bring in um, a large consulting organization, your, your Deloitte's or your McKenzie's or whomever who will do a six or nine month analysis of how they should restreamline all their um, processes to, to become more efficient and to operate in, in a different way. And, um, you know, a lot of that comes with a lot of bias. Um, they don't get the complete picture of what's happening. So, um, you know, what we're delivering here really comes with no bias and gives the, the complete story. So um, you're right, it's not something you dream up um, overnight and it is um, co somewhat complicated, but, um, you know, I, I think it attracted me when I saw what this guy was doing, because I know it has a lot of legs and value in, in a lot of different types of organizations. We just happen to focus heavily in the BPO space because they're very receptive to becoming more efficient because it hits their bottom line immediately. Brian, um, I are, do you define the company as a technology enabled services company or as a product company? I understand the transition that you've gone through um, starting out in services and how you've evolved the business sounds like over the last decade, but you know, how do you define the company today and how do you convince the investor community and, and, the, and, and the customer community on, on what the identity is of, of the business? Yeah, I mean, we identify ourselves 100%. 100% pure product at this point. Um, we're, we're doing zero um, consulting, um, producing zero consulting revenue, not chasing any of those types of opportunities, even though um, we get asked uh, about them from time to time from former customers. So from a, a DNA standpoint, there obviously is a transition, um, you know, especially for some of the people that were doing the frontline consulting in in terms of moving towards uh, being a product organization. Uh, you know, I, I come from a, a product background, um, so it's not hard for me personally to make the shift. And, you know, I'm, I'm running the, the, the ship, so to speak, um, currently today. And it brought in some people with us that also come with that pedigree and, and DNA. So, you know, when we tell our story, we don't necessarily go in there and say, hey, we're, we were a consulting company and, and we um, have evolved into a product company, we come and we land and we say, we've got this product called TK and it's going to help you continuously improve your operation. I think the thing that we focus on um, is continuous improvement. And to have continuous improvement, you have to have a product that's sitting there riding on top of your operation constantly and that we're constantly trying to improve and, and advance um, in terms of its features and functions as well um, so that you want to keep using it. So 
I, uh, I think that's the answer. And, and Brian, I have a question. Uh, how long, you, it sounds like you have a sort of standard package that you're using slightly customized each time you go in. So how long does it take from like start of coming into a company to the, to the, the product is up and running? Yeah, I, I had a slide on that. So um, the, the only customization we're doing, everything is productized within the analyses that we do. So all of the process mapping and everything that comes out of the box, really the customization, if you want to call that configuration is, is mapping the data streams from the customer's business units into our application. Um, and we have some pre-built adapters for systems that we've commonly worked with. So we've got pre-built adapters for things like ServiceNow um, on ITSM management and, and Genesis or Revaya for telephony systems. But we will work with anything. And a lot of times when you get into BPOs, they don't have, they can't dictate what systems they're using. So um, as we move from account to account, especially in a BPO, um, we're working with a customer right now where all they can give us is spreadsheets once every two hours. So we're we're literally building some ETL processes to pick up these spreadsheets from their from their clients and read it into our system. And and then the algorithms that are in there, they're all packaged, productized, and spit out the same. Um, results regardless of, of business. So to answer your question directly, um, we usually say it, it takes us um, two months to sort of get up and running with the customer, but we do offer a diagnostic service where they can just give us a historical extract of their data and we run it through our system and say, here's what we would have discovered the past three or six months. And we can do those in two or three weeks. And that's a, that's a good way and a quick way for us to get started with the customer when they're a little skeptical about whether or not our product would apply to their use case because people will dream up different use cases for this as well um, that we're not anticipating and one last question so uh if you so what's the size of the company you're working with now and what's the size you expect to be able to expand to because it sounds like you may be early stage smaller companies and or are you working in very large companies right now we're working in very large companies, which could be problematic for us because we're small and it's hard to get their attention. But the companies that we have signed and contracted with now are your 10 or $12 billion um, BPOs who are using us um, within um, a couple of accounts currently. So, you know, they serve, they have hundreds of customers of, of their own and they're saying, let's, let's, some of them are beyond trying it. Some of them are now moving into expanding it, but we're in a couple of their accounts and we want to be able to expand into all of them, really. Thank you. Great. Hey, thank you so much, Brian. And thank you uh, for the panel for the questions as well. Hey, um, I'd like to uh, um, bring up uh, Mumbi, uh, invite Mumbi Dunjo, CEO of uh, Naturez. If you could turn your camera and microphone on and uh, share your screen, that would be awesome. Sure. Okay. Um, let me share. Um, just give me a second. Uh, for some reason, it's not popped up here. Okay. Um, I just need to change a setting here. I didn't realize. I think I have a security setting that um, might be blocking sharing, which is uh, a little I, can, I can share. I can share it from uh, from from, from where. Slide, just, just let me know when to advance the slides. Okay, just give me one second. I think I might be able to. Um, right. I, I think I might be able to resolve it real quick. Um, I'm sorry, guys. I think it should work. Let me try it again. If not, Algid, I'll just let you share. Yeah, you know what? Let me let me just go ahead and yeah, let's do it. And just let me know when to advance slides. Can you see it? Yes, I can. 
um, not as clearly, but let me see. All right, uh, I'll do my best with this. Um, all right, oh, um, I'll start now. Okay, hi everyone. My name is Mombi Tunjua. I'm the founder and CEO of Naturas. Today I'm here to share with you how Naturas harnesses the power of nature to care for curls. Next. Did you know that over 60% of people in the US have got curly hair? Curly hair can be frizzy and dry. It can be difficult to comb, manage, and style. Industry solutions include the use of uh, harsh chemicals, high heat, expensive treatments, all of which can lead to breakage, thinning, and eventually hair loss. A study in Boston University showed a correlation between the use of chemical relaxers and the growth of intrauterine fibroids. Next. Having experienced some of these problems myself, I created proprietary formulas that we now that we own. I have a background in chemistry and also 11 years experience in big pharma. I am my customer, I get her, she gets us. Next. I created the moisture bus system using uh, natural and ingredient natural and organic ingredients that I scientifically balanced to deliver sustained moisture as well as protein to repair and improve the texture of hair. Next. We're a clean beauty brand. We are 100% vegan. We do not use ingredients like parabens which have been found in cancerous breast tissue. Next. So what have we achieved so far? We have created formulas, we've tested, iterated through testing. We have acquired over a thousand customers who have provided over 200 testimonials validating the efficacy of our, our products. We have also tested distribution channels and converged on e-commerce at this stage. Our top 10% uh, percent repeat customers have come back to us on average five times and have spent um, over $200 in our online store. Our returning customer rate is three times the industry average. Next. So what are our customers saying? Beth says that her hair is soft, bouncy, and shiny after using Naturals products. Kathy's hair has grown back. Idris has got plaque psoriasis, and Naturals products are the only ones that do not make her plaque psoriasis act up and her hair can grow. Debbie has used over 75 products, and um, Naturals products are the only ones that work, um, that sustain moisture in her hair. Next. We can serve millions of women like this. Um, and uh, the market opportunity is huge. It's $3 billion at the lower end and $80 billion at the global scale. Next slide. The, the, our, our client is the professional woman who typically shops for her family and herself online. She's health conscious, reads her labels, and is between 25 to 65 years old. We would acquire her through digital marketing strategies, PR. We would entice her by offering the rehydrating mist and detangler, and then upselling her on our three product subscription system. Next. So how do we win? We win because we deliver three times more moisture based on our clients. We offer a three-step system um, and, and that's a no guesswork system. We see ourselves among a, a, a trailblazers in the clean beauty industry. Next, we differentiate ourselves by um, offering a three-step system that's 100% vegan online. Next, we are ready to launch. We have websites asset in place. We have relationships with contract manufacturing as well as order fulfillment who can grow with us. Next. So we have proven what the customers are willing to pay. We have proven um, how often they come back by selling a subscription system every two months with gross margins in the area of 76%. We see ourselves growing to an $18 million business by 2024. Next. The team that will get us there um, consists of experts in direct-to-consumer marketing, um, di digital marketing, as well as supply chain and logistics management. Our advisory team consists of um, investors, business exec executives, as well um, uh, as in, uh, serial entrepreneurs who will help us grow our business strategically. So we are asking 
for a $1 million investment um, today. Uh, we are seeking a $1 million investment in an open round. We are offering a convertible note, 20% um, discount, 6% interest rate. Um, we would use it as uh, shown here on the slide. And we have $25,000 committed um, by the Bucks County Industrial Development Authority, as well as um, being in due diligence with Social Venture Circle and Broad Street Angels. Next. Bye. Um, so I would like to highlight two key um, companies, Shea Moisture, Carl Stoddard, that have exited in this space, and we can exit into any of these companies. We saw a problem in the market. We created a, a solution to solve it. We have proven um, it, the efficacy through a thousand customers. We have an experienced team in place and a strong advisory board to help us grow. We'd love to invite you to join us in growing naturals and into harnessing the power of nature to care for curls. Thank you. Thanks. Um, I'm going to stop the share here. Uh, we'll have five minutes for Q&A from the judges. Uh, and again, uh, for uh, participants, please check your uh, chat screen for time, please. For judges, you have the time. It's good to see you again, because I know that uh, Broad Street Angels is uh, still looking at you, so that's a good thing. Uh, yeah. So the million dollars will be spent primarily for inventory, for uh, expansion. What's, what's the breakdown of the million dollars and how you're looking to spend it? So we are looking to spend um, around 30, 32% um, on marketing. So marketing is the biggest one right now because we have created the formulas. We have proven them out in the market. We know they work. So what we really need to do is to actually scale our sales and grow through marketing. So that's one area. The next area that we would be spending that might be around, um, I think 30% would be um, operations. So we need to bring in an expert team in place to help us um, run these ex operations and grow the business. We also need to build inventory. So about 18% um, would be used um, on, on you know, building the inventory to support um, our, project, our projected sales. And how do you get the market uh, message out? How is that? What's the channels that you use right now? So the channels that we would use in terms of marketing, we would use uh, social media is huge. Um, so one of the things that we, we want to focus on is uh, Facebook ads. Um, that at least is cheaper in terms of getting to people. We can target very well. And we want to really use digital um, advertising because it makes it easier for us to really look at something we call the media efficiency ratio. So we would need to create um, ads and optimize them. And what happens is that when you optimize the ads, your target, you're, you're really getting to your target audience. You are reducing the cost of actually reaching the audience. And when you, you get the ad in terms of even the creative, what gets their attention, what stops the scroll, when you get to the point where it's really well optimized, then you're able to really ramp up um, skills because, um, sales because yeah, you're able to predict that by putting in X amount of dollars, we can get X amount of people to come and convert on our websites. So that's one way. Another way in terms of marketing and reaching our audience is through PR. So we need to get our story out there. We have a unique story um, in this market, it, which is really hot right now. Um, the story of the founder is very, um, is very important. And so we wanna make sure that that story gets out there through PR. So those are two major channels um, that we are thinking in, in terms of um, getting to our end um, customer. Thank you. Um, let me follow up with that. Um, it was good to see you again as well. We saw you about a, you. a couple of weeks ago. Yes. Uh, what if any marketing channels have been tried already? Clearly influencers and social media are gonna be the way to go. Have you run any test budgets so that you know how to spend the money or are you just starting that process now? Um, we have run uh, some test budgets. So that's why we've been doing quite a lot of testing to get to this point. We have found that um, um, influencers are very, very helpful. They, first of all, they help create content um, and they also help um, reach various aspects, um, various parts of the market where people can resonate. I have that type of hair or, you know, they, so, so social media um, influencers are going to be critical in terms of us um, um, working with them. And um, 
what do I, am I answering your question? Is there a, a something else in addition to your question that I need to address? No, how the test just wanted to know how the test budgets work. Yeah, so the test budget has shown us that that is an approach we, we need to use with, with um, really going after influencers as well to help talk about our products. I'll, I'll be quick. Um, first of all, I enjoyed your presentation. Thank you. You covered it a lot of territory very well. Okay, and, thank you. And so thank you for that. Um, right to the point, um, do you know what your customer acquisition cost is? I, I think I saw your product cost $60. Um, any idea what your uh, maybe customer acquisition costs uh, and your, your, um, your gross profit margin on a unit? Yes, so our customer acquisition cost at this point is around $12 to $15. But again, we've been testing, we've kept everything sort of low scale as we've done this. Um, that acquisition cost could go up, um, you know, especially as we test, as we reach um, uh, larger markets. But our goal is to always drive that down. I think we're not too badly off with the 12 to 15. Um, if we can stay around there, that would be good. But it's plus or minus um, maybe 20, 25 percent. And then you had a second question. Uh, yeah, uh, your unit gross profit. The gross margin. Oh, yeah. yeah, so we are at about 76 percent gross margin. Okay. Hey, thank you so much, uh, Mumbi, and thank you, judges. Um, I'd like to invite up, uh, maybe if you could take the camera and microphone off, I'll invite up Michael Graham. Uh, if you could turn your camera and mic on. You have five minutes. Keep an eye out for the chat uh, window at the bottom, but I'll also um, announce it when you have a minute left. Excellent. Thank you, Docker. Thank you, Algin. I mean, well, our B2B SaaS product is Opus. It's a digital adoption solution which makes learning and using enterprise applications more effective while also helping our customers in other ways during the implementation of enterprise applications. By enterprise applications, I mean these types of applications which fall into these categories represented by these types of software makers. These categories in blue are very, oops, I went the wrong way, sorry. These categories in blue are very complicated applications, are used by large portions of a company's workforce, and they routinely experience severe adoption issues. That's why we built Opus for enterprise digital adoption. Opus works by watching somebody execute a process in an application. The data collected is stored in the, in the cloud, and from this, we automatically generate a variety of outputs, like you see here at the bottom, which are used for user acceptance testing, compliance, training, and what we call in-application user support. Without Opus, generating this would take 30 to 50 hours. With Opus, it literally takes minutes. In terms of the market, Gardner recognized digital adoption solutions as a new software category in 2019, estimated at 10 billion, and they recently updated their projected rate of adoption, predicting very, very high category growth. This graphic represents a digital transformation process involving the implementation of one or more enterprise applications. Transformations have two lives, pre-go live and post-go live. Before go live, digital enablement starts with documentation for user acceptance testing, compliance, and training. Post-go live focuses on user onboarding and effective use of the application. Here, there's a group of competitors who generate a form of adoption and assistance called a walkthrough. A walkthrough pushes users through a task step by step, and it's the most de demanded form of digital adoption assistance. I call this field level because building the walkthroughs requires them to be built manually, field by field, which means it's very difficult to use, time consuming, takes a lot of skill, and as a result, walkthroughs can only be generated for a low volume of processes. Process level competitors are like Opus, capturing someone doing a process and automatically generating pre-go live documentation and post-go live user content. These technologies are for high volume, but they don't generate the walkthrough like the field level competitors. All, uh, but unlike Opus, they aren't multi-tenant, making their deployment and maintenance more costly and difficult. We win because Opus is built for enterprise. We're built for the scale of enterprise applications and environments. Our speed and ease of use enables a community of content creators. We handle complexity, project complexity and process complexity and our total cost of ownership is low. And now we're going to add to our competitive advantage hugely with Follow Me. 
Follow Me will be the first high velocity, high volume walkthrough created automatically, which means that there will be huge cost savings versus Walk Me and the others. And this is a result of a technology breakthrough made in 2020. Follow Me also removes the barrier to broader effectiveness analytics because it eliminates the volume constraints of the field level competitors. And we're targeting Q4 for launch. And this is what Follow Me will do for our positioning. Opus will be the first complete digital adoption solution for the enterprise market. Our approach to the market is to target enterprise applications and those who buy and use them, implement and service them, and make them. Mid-market, large, and enterprise entities are our customer targets. The people who implement enterprise applications are our channel targets. And ISVs, the software makers, are both a customer target and a channel target. We have 33 customers and here's a handful using us on these applications in the upper right and many more. And these are our most productive partners. KPMG has just begun to fuel our pipeline and are in the stages, last stages actually, of building a new service offering around Opus. One minute. DXC has just decided to embed us as a core capability in their public sector solution, becoming our first ISV. These two graphs show what we project will occur in terms of ARR revenue and EBITDA. Is this kind of growth feasible? Walk Me started in 2012, took the next four years to get to 30 million ARR and the last four has exploded to almost 200. Pendo started in 2014 and is cresting 100 million. This can and will happen with Epilog. The core team has, is deep in digital adoption experience and the enterprise market. And we're looking for 3 million, which will increase our value significantly. We believe it will provide us 18 months of runway to a much higher valuation. I believe there will be a number of acquisition exit opportunities shown here and an IP, IPO if this thing explodes. Lastly, here's the comps on our chief competitors. Thank you. And I'll leave you with a few quotes. Uh, thank you, Mike. If uh, judges could turn your cameras on, please. Thank you. And you can take the share off, Mike. Bill, I think it's your turn to go first. Okay, I'm on then. Um, Mike, thank you. Um, thanks for the presentation. I'm, I'm going to stay away from the technical side of, of the domain here and, and go right to the deal side. You're raising $3 million. Um, can you just real quick high point the, the, the revenue metrics, the valuation, and, and a little bit about the deal structure? Sure. Thank you. So we're looking for $3 million in equity. Everything in the company is common right now, so it's a very simple cap table. Uh, we, in, we anticipate that this equity will be preferred. Uh, we're looking at a six million dollar valuation. We're certainly not stretching for the kind of multiples I just showed you. Um, so, uh, and the use of proceeds I showed you really quickly. I don't expect you to see, but I don't think that was part of your question. The last part that would be missing would would be, I, and I think you mentioned that your ARR was going to get to eight fifty in um, in April. No, no, eight. Uh, it was going to get to a million. We have eight fifty as we speak, and okay. we have deal closings in in underway with. Conviva Healthcare, with Apollo Management Systems, with the Methodist Health, and et cetera, that will get us beyond the million dollar mark in that time frame. Okay, thank you. Mike, how do you stay out of getting drug into the integration and services world that I'm sure your customers drag you into all the time? I know you clearly have a software solution, which is what the core innovation is. But I can imagine what the requests and demands of some of these customers are. Well, can't you do this and can't you do that? How do you say a software company and not a services company? Because I imagine that tension is significant in this business. It is. That's an excellent question. In fact, we have customers in common with Walkman and the others. Um, and I'll use one of those customers as an example. National Heritage Academy is 94 uh, schools. There's a charter school operator, 5,000 employees, 60,000 uh, students. And uh, they were deploying their student information system and they bought WalkMe and they just, they, their volume need for what WalkMe could generate was, uh, was just beyond the task. So they had to retain WalkMe to create the walkthroughs for them. And that was extremely expensive and time consuming. It took weeks of duration for turnaround times on those things. 
That's not the case with Opus. Opus is, can be used by any subject matter expert to record a process, literally in minutes. Secondly, uh, and so from a services point of view, there's not the real need to augment this, have staff augmentation to accomplish the mission. Secondly, as far as you know, resisting the urge, can you do this and can you do that? Well, that's what software companies that are successful have to do. You have to correct, you have to have a product function that can you know, certainly look at enhancements and product extensions and understand how commercially generalizable they are. I'm not sure that was part of your question, but in terms of professional services, we don't uh, actually have a revenue line for professional services because we don't do them. And when that is needed, our partners, the systems integrators on these projects provide those services. And I have a question right now, um, Mike. How many how many installations do you have right now? How many customers? 33. 33 of the nature that I quickly flashed through that are all mid-market large and enterprise entities. We don't always get the entire enterprise. We'll go on the in on the backs of a project that they have, which may touch only portions of their population, but over time they'll expand. I'll, I'll just quickly say that that NHA customer brought us in on the backs of their student information system, which was their big bad application. They're now using us on 15 other applications and they have 60 subject matter experts that create uh, the, the content for the users. And when I saw the PL, I believe you don't break even until several years past the... Yeah, past we're going to go after this very hard because as I mentioned, uh, the, the market leaders, the segment leaders have exploded in the last three and four years. I mean, exploded. And, uh, you know, marketing is important. So I, we're going to pursue the market. Now we'll also, you know, monitor those metrics. But right now with $2,000 to $3,000 a month spent on LinkedIn ads, we're generating five to 10 leads. We're converting almost 30% of those to opportunities and turning 40% of those into wins. I retained a, a fractional chief marketing officer from uh, Chief Outsiders who tore apart our metrics and our market and has identified that for uh, the foreseeable future, it's a function of dialing up the dollars with competency in the executing marketing. Mike, we're almost out of time here. I got to ask this question. Um, with, with, with a million in ARR, a, a six million pre-money valuation, a, a technology space, recurring revenue business, how long have you been marketing this deal and why hasn't someone jumped on it and taken it out already? I started three weeks ago. Catherine was an early outreach about three weeks ago, I believe. Yeah. And this, this brings one more financial question up. So $3 million will take you how long for the next raise? 18 months, give or take, you know, depending upon the, the rate of, of adoption and the need to either dial it up or dial it down as we look at that. Time. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. The camera's off. Uh, I'd like to invite Carolyn from Gen Z. I think so, too. Yeah. All right. I'm going to start my stopwatch as well. All right. Hi, everyone. My name is Carolyn Horner, and I'm the co-founder of Gen Z, a mobile-first e-commerce marketplace. At Gen Z, we're creating the most personalized, data-driven way for busy parents to shop for their kids, starting with shoes. Why shoes? Well, Gen Z was created in 2016, and that was the same year that StrideRight, once the leader in the kids' shoe space, closed all 200 of their stores. So parents turn to Amazon and Zappos, which offer a fast but not easy way to shop. This is mainly because every brand fits differently, which is why so many parents buy multiple sizes knowing they'll have to deal with returns. This is time consuming for parents who are buying kids shoes every few months. And it's also inefficient for shoe brands who have to deal with the cost of those returns. So Gen Z set out to create a more efficient way to buy and sell products online. Here's how it works. A parent begins by downloading the Gen Z app and creating a profile. They answer a few questions about their child, including the age and the last shoes worn. The data we collect in this onboarding process is used to then personalize every aspect of the shopping experience on Gen Z. For example, we use this data to curate a selection of shoes based on information about that child. We also use this data to calculate the child's correct size in every shoe on our store making it easy for a parent to understand how a specific shoe fits and what size she should buy. We had an explosive year last year. In terms of revenue in 2019, we generated about $15,000. In 2020, we did close to 170,000. 
Additionally, we saw a strong repeat customer rate of 20% month over month. Now our user experience is so easy because our backend technology is robust. Within our custom backend dashboard, we have multiple databases, including one that aggregates all of the shoes we sell and how they fit. We have over 3,000 SKUs of shoes that have been measured, tagged, and sorted by our team. We also have 70,000 user profiles. It's when we combine these two data sets together that we're able to match the, the best shoe in the correct size for parents. This obviously offers a great customer experience, but it also makes our return rate half the industry average at 15%. To put that in other words, when shopping in Zapp on Zappos, one in three shoes have to be returned. When shopping on Gen Z, only one in 10 shoes have to be returned. Our low return rate is why so many brands are eager to partner with us. Speaking of, let's look at how Gen Z makes money. This year, we're focused on becoming a dropship business. This means that we don't buy or hold inventory, rather that when an order is placed on Gen Z, we send that order to the shoe brand who fulfills it on our behalf. As of uh, this year, we have six dropship partners on our platform with an average gross margin of around 27%. Now, Gen Z is disrupting a large and extremely fragmented market. There are 20 million working millennial moms in the US with young kids. The best part about our market is that they're growing by a few million each year. Parents spend about $2,000 per child per year, bringing our serviceable addressable market to around $40 billion. Now, how we think about becoming a big business over the next few years is first and foremost, capturing 0.5% of our target market. When they buy about four pairs of shoes with Gen Z in one year, we'll be generating about $60 million of top line revenue by 2023. This is our break even point. However, we know that it's just the beginning. By using our data to fully understand a child and their growth, we can start to predict what other items they'll need each season. Toys, accessories, furniture, these are all high margin items that lend themselves to the type of curation that Gen Z provides. We look at other marketplaces like right. Chewy, like Chewy, that set out uh, to disrupt one category through customer service and curation. Ultimately, we see a world where Gen Z becomes a one-stop shop for busy parents. I don't think you said time, so I'm going to wrap up with two more slides. Um, our team right now is 12 full-time employees. My co-founder Eve leads all of our operations and vendor relationships. We also have uh, a, a tech team of six engineers. Um, our lead front and back-end developers each have 15 years of experience behind them. And then in summary, we're currently raising a $3 million seed round. We have about 70% of the round circled and a lead investor on board. With this round, we aim to increase our marketing spend as well as expand our team to generate about $1.7 million of forecasted revenue this year. And I have to say it, while the shoes may be small, the opportunity ahead is big. I look forward to your questions and thank you so much. Carolyn, talk to me about the um, about the blended CAC at thirty bucks. What, what what are the channels? What's the makeup? How much are are viral leads? How much are paid? Run us through that. Yeah. Um. So thirty to thirty bucks, actually thirty six dollars specifically, um, is our forecast at CAC. Our current CAC right now is seventy dollars. Where that comes from is about 25% is through paid ads. We spend about $20,000 on paid ads per month, primarily on Instagram and Facebook. 25% um, of our sales come from influencer partnerships. So similar to what Mumbi mentioned, just working with influencers to, in exchange for one or two pairs of shoes, they promote Gen Z. Um, and then the other 50% of our sales are organic. So we currently have a one-to-one -one ratio and it's really through you know, having more referral programs within the app opportunities to share that we want to bump up that organic, um, those organic leads this year to bring our CAC down to the $36 number. And, and, and you're moving into essentially more clothing, is that correct? And so how does that impact everything? Yep. So what we understand is that 68% of our customers are first walkers, and that's a really unique time to start 
forming a relationship with parents, mainly because as their child starts walking, they need different toys and furniture to go along with that stage of development. So that's actually the horizontal category that we want to start with first, because we feel like we have the most understanding of our customer. Um, but again, right now we're focused on shoes and becoming the leader in this space um, before moving into other categories and really expanding our, our bandwidth um, down the line. Did I see it correctly that that the forecasted gross margin is 17%? 17% this year, and then 26% the following year. And is that 17% based on a $70 CAC or a blending it down from 70 down to 36? Um, or, the, or maybe I'll just ask the question this way. What, what CAC is it based on? Because you quoted two CACs. One, you're at 70 today. You're looking to get to 36. Um, when you look at 17% gross margins for the year of 2021, what's your CAC for 2021? Yeah, so the reason I, I like the thirty, like the $36 CAC is because it gives us a one-year payback period. So currently our average order value is $60. If we continue to improve gross margin over time to around 30%, then 30% of that $60 average order value is eight. This is, I can send you the numbers afterwards, but it gets to around $18. And with our retention rate, 18 times two is 36. So it gets us to that one year payback period. I know you followed along because you're nodding, but. Yeah, I, I followed, but what I didn't hear was, I, I heard what you like and what you aspire to, but I didn't hear what it is. So I think that's an important assumption for um, you know the next 12 months. Yeah, so our current CAC, our current blended CAC right now is $70. Um, our marketing team this year is focused on bringing that down to 36. Okay. So then is, is that your, is 70 the number that you're modeling for 2021 or is it 36 or is it somewhere in between? So 70 is the, the number that we're modeling, but it, right now that doesn't, um, our, our gross margin and how we're working with brands who drop ship with us is, is unrelated to the CAC that we're trying to achieve with parents. Got it. Okay, thank you. Here, one more minute for more questions. I'll, I'll go ahead then. Go yeah. less on the numbers and more on the business strategy. When does the shift happen from a niche go-to-market with a niche service to a more broader, we're going to do more for each one of our customers strategy? What, what yeah. point in time does that, does that occur and like what scale do you need to be at to get there? Yeah. So we really want to have a core group of moms. So about like 20 to 25,000 moms who are repeatedly buying shoes on our platform in order to kind of have the, the demand proven and the understanding of the customer before going into to new products. So I think if we spread ourselves too thin right now, it becomes kind of confusing what we offer, what we're really experts at. Um, and so staying really focused on where we know demand is, um, as well as, you know, what we've gained expertise in over the past few years. Um, right now is our core focus, but probably by next, by beginning of next year, we'll want to start expanding into those new categories. Thank you, uh, Carolyn. And um, if I could uh, welcome up uh, Dr. Rakesh Shah for our final presentation from Doctors Link. Uh, and Rakesh, if you could uh, share your screen, please. Absolutely. Just make sure that's working. Your time Great. Thank you everyone for uh, giving me the opportunity to speak with you today. My journey started about 20 years ago. As a practicing cardiologist, I've had the opportunity to save not only thousands of lives, but positively affect many more. But my journey really came down to a singular question. About four years ago, when I was in the middle of my Oxford MBA, one of my classmates asked me, Rakesh, what do I do if my mom has chest pain? To which the simple answer for any clinician these days is essentially call 911. However, his question was much more in depth. Um, 
His question was, how do I know if it's real? How do I know if I really need to take my mom to the emergency room? And I'd been struggling with this for quite some time. And that's when I really came up with MHeart. MHeart gives patients the opportunity to evaluate their chest pain anytime, anywhere, without necessarily having to go to the emergency room. Chest pain in the United States has become a very costly diagnostic dilemma, costing approximately five to $35 billion for approximately 10 million chest pain visits to the emergency room. Unfortunately, almost 90%, maybe actually more than 90% statistically do not need an ED level of care. This results in a significant impact to our healthcare system as well as our patients. So the question really becomes is, this chest pain symptom cycle of going to the emergency room, having your EKG done, having some blood work done or other testing only to be followed up with a, a evaluation by a cardiologist or a specialist to then go home or be observed in the hospital repeats itself over and over again with subsequent episodes of chest pain because patients don't wanna take the chance nor do clinicians that this could be a real event. Our goal is to break this cycle. MHeart offers that opportunity. It's one platform with two care pathways. The idea is to achieve better outcomes by having cardiologists prescribe MHeart. Patients are enrolled on our chronic disease platform, which would not only take in their past medical history, but also a detailed symptom questionnaire of their chest pain episode. And if that was a cardiac event, what were the symptoms surrounding it? If it was reflux, what were the symptoms? If it was pneumonia, what were the symptoms? They would also be taught to learn how to utilize the VEKG. It's a vital EKG, which not only is a 10 lead EKG of medical grade quality, but it also ha has other vital sign parameters built into it, coupled together with the MHeart app and the cloud. The chronic disease pathway takes patients, notifies them, allows us to update their medication list or reconcile them to minimize errors and also perform remote monitoring so that on a monthly basis or every few weeks, we can have them perform their VEKG. And what the data coming out of Europe, as well as the Mayo Clinic, is that serial EKGs allow us to predict cardiac events before they occur. Now, if that same chest a patient were to have chest pain, Two we, can then, we can then move on to the mobile triage platform. In essence, when they have chest pain, the first question that's asked when they activate the app is, are you having symptoms? If the patient is having symptoms, then the pathway turns into a symptoms questionnaire, asking the very same questions that I would ask if I were seeing the patient in the emergency room. And it takes about three minutes to under, go through the questionnaire. They would also perform their VEKG and receive a risk gratified output in the form of a green light, red light, or a yellow light, signifying high risk, low risk, or moderate risk. All of that information can then be pushed to the clinician as well. And if you have a red light, you should really call 911. In the end, all of our stakeholders benefit. The first one are patients. Patients no longer have to simply rely on symptoms and wait for a physician to call back only to tell them they have to go to the emergency room. Hospitals are desperately looking to reduce their uh, cost footprint. Uh, these observation patients cost the hospitals a significant amount of money and a vast majority of the hospitals actually lose money on these observation status. And as a clinician, when I review uh, on a monthly basis or review that acute episode, there's an opportunity for reimbursement to take place as well. Thank you. MHeart separates itself from its competitors. We're the only platform to perform all of these other parameters to enhance clinical engagement. Our goal to profitability is within four years through a low cost uh, uh, retail cost for healthcare systems to provide to their patients with an annual subscription fee model. First generation gets us onto the marketplace by the end of 2021 with the goal to be fully live with our software as a medical device by 2023. There's a large addressable market, 34 million patients with diabetes, 30 million with heart disease, 30 million suffer from non-cardiac chest pain of which 70% are evaluated by cardiologists and 1.1 million patients with um, heart attacks on an annual basis. Our ask is a $1.2 million ask, either in the form of a convertible note or a straight equity raise. So with that, I'll end the presentation and open it up to question and Q&A.
clearly Bill is our ringer for this, but let me ask one, one non-medical question first. Um, what is the liability aspect of this when you give them the, the yellow and they were really red? And what, what, what do you have to do in those situations? Because no information sometimes better than wrong information. Correct. So in that situation, it, the likelihood is low because the way the algorithm would be written, uh, we would want to be, we would want to err on the side of caution, much more so than being cavalier about this. We don't want to be cavalier, but more importantly, it's the low risk that really doesn't need to come to the emergency room. The moderate risk, all of this information is then pushed out immediately to the clinician. So if you're having chest pain, it needs to be pushed out. Remember, this is prescribed by a clinician, a cardiologist typically, so that a yellow light, please push this to your clinician and have the clinician call back. For me, on the other hand, as a receiving cardiologist, and I've talked to numerous colleagues, and they wish that there was a device of this nature. The reason being is they want the information. I wanna be able to look at the current EKG, previous EKG, look at the symptom history and compare all of that information. In the long run, our goal is to automate everything. But if there's still a yellow light, hey, let's just push this out to your clinician. Let's get feedback from them as well. But now it's, an, it's educated. It's not just a guessing game any longer. Thanks for the presentation, Rakesh. And, and it, you've got a great background. And, and I, I, I enjoyed looking into yet another huge business case in healthcare. Um, the big question that always exists in any model that goes after wellness in healthcare, and I look at your business as a business that is not on the administrative side of healthcare, but is on the wellness side of healthcare, is who's gonna pay for it? And we have a unique system here in the US with three parties, a payer, a consumer, and a provider providing the care. And it seems like in your model, you are targeting to generate revenue from the provider. So my question is, how did you evaluate the business model, given you have no revenue yet from what I saw, Maybe you have other ways that you've tested the market, but how did you evaluate this? And, and how do you know that that is going to be the right model and it's not going to be going to a health plan or going direct to consumer as, as being the other two obvious um, possibilities? Okay, so direct to consumer, I'm not a big fan of, at least not at this stage or early on. Once we've perfected the model, it's something maybe that we could consider. However, we want to keep the clinician engaged. I sit on our accountable care organizations board. I've run this by our director. I've talked to various uh, hospital and system level administrators. Their goal is if we can keep patients out of the emergency room, it's a win-win. Uh, they are more than willing to pay for this. So with, when I was in my MBA, I actually started doing all the research at that point in time. Once I came up with this idea, I said, what a perfect time to start doing all the background research, write up all the papers and start interviewing people. As I talked to the healthcare administrators, I simply put it out to them. If you were charged 250, 500, 750, or $1,000 for this device, and if it existed, is that something appealing to you? And if so, how much would you pay? And the answer was unequivocally, simply blank statement, yes. They're more than willing to pay $1,000. If you do the math, especially in cardiology, when at least 70 to 80% of the cardiologists in the United States are employed, the healthcare system actually will make money on the CPT codes for chronic disease management and remote patient monitoring. So it winds up essentially being a no-brainer. Within the first cost, their cost of acquiring the device and supporting that patient for the next 10 years is pretty much done. Did you um, do any research or querying in the health plan segment? Health plan segment in what aspect? Well, we talked about consumer, provider, and payer being the, the three sides of our healthcare system in the U.S. And you, I agree with you, the consumer probably stay away from, especially early on. You said there's willingness to pay from the provider side. My question is, I gotcha. how did you evaluate it? And you told me the how, but you didn't tell me anything about health plans or payers. So did you sure. do anything with health plans? Do you think there's something? I I started talking to a few. Uh, most healthcare plans are now starting to get into some sort of investment opportunity with this. So I'm actually in the process of making headway with Blue Cross Blue Shield at this point. 
Um, I do have some insider connections with uh, Aetna as well. And having talked to their um, chief medical officers, it's something that they would definitely be interested in. But I think it's much harder for them to necessarily implement, uh, though if it's a value add that they provide to their uh, patients, it may be an opportunity for them to retain patients. Uh, the, other pos the other reason healthcare systems would be interested is right now there's a massive war going on uh, in terms of trying to steal patients essentially from one healthcare system to another. We're constantly talking about leakage. I'm the president of our medical staff and this is something that comes up. I've been the interim CMO. And how do you help systems retain patients? We can white label the device for them. And so now it's Penns or Jefferson or Temple or Geisinger or whoever. Um, so it gives the opportunity to not only retain patients, but also keep them within the system. And those physicians within the system are the ones who would be assisting patients. So you actually wind up enhancing the doctor-patient uh, provider relationship. Oh, this is Catherine O'Neill. And uh, um, Danielle, you'll have to uh, unmute my picture because my pictures, I can't change that uh, right now. Um, I'm, I'm really familiar right now with this great surge uh, in um, people buying their EKGs. Everyone mm -hmm. I know who's had a heart problem has gone out and bought the EK, you know, the, the portable EKG. Yes. And this is certainly a path to, to monetize that and Im improve the quality of the medical care to it. Um, do you have any idea of the number of these individual, you know, EKGs that have been sold? It's got to be a phenomenal number. Oh, it's a phenomenal number. It's in the millions at five to 10 million. And, and these, are, these are all ones that focus specifically on the AFib market. AFib will continue to grow as the population ages and heart disease continues to remain uh, as the number one killer. Um, but in order to evaluate chest pain mm -hmm. and any, any reason for having chest pain, you cannot do it with one of those cardio mobiles or an Apple watch. It's simply not enough data. You need to create a system that allows portability and be able to perform at least a 10 lead EKG. And that's what we're offering. Okay, so it's a it's a better it's a better uh, uh, diagnostic. No, that's not diagnostic. Hands down. It's a better exactly. it's a better piece of equipment. It allows a, the doctor to diagnose better. Okay, yeah, that's and, which correct. is has got to be terribly attractive to most uh, medical providers. Okay, just from oh. a from a revenue standpoint. Oh yeah, absolutely. You know, right now I recommend the Apple Watch or the Cardio Mobile for patients, but I get nothing in return for it. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, hey, thank you very much. Thank you to the judges. Thank you to all the participants. Yeah, well, I, I, I think it was great. A lot of great presentation, great ideas. Um, but we were yeah, really aligned on the winner. And, okay. and so um, we're pleased to announce that Mike with Epilog is going to take it away. So congratulations to Mike and, and your team. Thanks. I whooped. I couldn't get my camera on my mic off in time for you to hear the whoop. So thank you very much.